Today, I have a very special guest with me, Dr. J. Welcome to the channel, Dr. J. Hey, Anna. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Tell us a little bit about what you do and a little bit about your personal life. Yeah, so um, I'm, I call myself a child-free wealth specialist, which is just a fancy way of saying I do life and financial planning for child-free folks. My wife and I, we're child-free, just us, the two mastiffs and a jerk cat. Um, I say jerk cat because he hisses at me every time I go by, but that's our life. We're, we're in uh, rural Mississippi, so it's a fun time. I, I've got a cat that's got a little bit of attitude as well. He hisses at me when I open the door. It, my wife shares an office with him. I swear it's his room and oh, she course. just happens to get the work there. And I'll open the door, he hiss at me, and then asks me to pet him. I'm like, how can you? You've recently written a book, so congratulations. That's huge. And your book is a collection of 26 stories of interviews that you've done with child-free people. Tell us a little bit more about why you wanted to write this book and what your book is about. I did all this work to become a certified financial planner, all these classes and things you do. And never once did they have a mention of being child-free. And I couldn't understand it. You know, the number I use, I don't know what you use, but 11% of the U.S. over 55 is child free. So I'm like, it's not a small percentage in the financial land, but there's nothing. I mean, zero. And I've got a PhD and I come from a research background. And what my advisor told me is, well, maybe there's a blank in a space for a reason. But I was like, no, this makes no sense to just ignore child free folks. So I went out. Um, actually, people like you helped out actually posting the survey and doing interviews is great. I had over 300 responses and surveys and 26 interviews. And originally I was going to write a book just about like personal finance. You know, what do you do? Mm -hmm. But the stories were so much more important and so much, so much, so they grabbed you. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got to publish these first. So really what it is, is these 26 stories of people from 22 to 52, people that are broke, people that are rich. And it's just this picture about wealth that I didn't expect. And it's just amazing to get to hear their stories. Mm -hmm. I've been able to read the book. And one thing that I found really interesting was the vulnerability that people had with you when they share their stories, because it can be difficult to talk about finances. And if you're going through hard times, it's hard to say, hey, here's my life. I'm putting it out for people to read. You know, I've come to the conclusion that people would rather talk about their sex life than their financial life. <laughs> it's true. I mean, in child-free community, we'll talk about sterilization like it's nothing. Okay, that's just like, yep, snip, nope, nope, no big deal. Let's talk about your finances. Well, uh, that's personal. And I'm like, wait a minute, how do we draw the line? It was really interesting for me to hear the stories. And I really, I'm just a narrator in the book. It, the book's all about them. But these people had stories. You know, Carly shares a story. She moved back from Bulgaria with her husband just when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And they lost jobs and went through it. They were living on an air mattress. They're barely making ends meet. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, you're child free. You must be rich. Yeah. And she's like, do you want to see my house? You know, I, like we were, they were very excited. They got a bed. These stories are just amazing. And at the same time, you, know, you got people that, you know, at 50 retired and that's or 40 or whatever. And people were willing to share, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. There's often a misconception of child-free people. Like you said, people hear that you're child-free and they just assume you have bags of money and you're going to be retiring at 45 or 50. And your life is essentially far less complicated than someone who has children. Yes, there are some of those stories that are just like the amazing story that we all dream of having, but there are many more stories that are so much more realistic, especially with COVID hitting. It hit child-free people as well. It wasn't just people who struggled with families. I finished the research essentially February of 2022. So that's the mm -hmm. end of the COVID world. Yeah. But you heard COVID stories all throughout and frankly, some good, some bad. Yes. Um, you know, some people had success and some people it rocked their world. Yeah. And you're right. Being child-free doesn't protect you from incoming inequalities or, you know, the disparities or all the other things. And let's be real. The income tax and financial situation is made for families. There's such a large percentage of population that we're just like, yep, good luck. It's very true. How long did it take you to do all of this research for the book? Yeah, so I started working on it last year. It's been about a year in process. The interviews themselves, about an hour interview, but it takes hours of work to work it through and put it through the process. In actuality, what I started off with this one book on personal finance is going to be two books now. Mm -hmm. And of course, like, like any good author, you keep expanding your research. And I'm like, I got to stop at some point and publish it and get it out there which is where I'm at now. Yes. Now I get to wait for the feedback. I, I'm a little, um, 
cautious. Let's call it that. When I was doing the research, I put out an ad saying, hey, tell me about your child-free life. I had people flag that as hate speech uh, multiple times. Oh, yeah. That was on Reddit. <laughs> so that, that's Reddit's world. But oh, it's I, okay, Reddit. Yeah, <laughs> that, but that explains it. <laughs> I couldn't understand how just asking about being child-free is hate speech. And I just talked to, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a press run now. And people are like, well, I'm not sure we're able to put child-free in print. So do you have other terms? I'm like, the book's Portrait of Child-Free Wealth. There's nothing you're going to get around it. I'm like, wow. I didn't know it's such a big issue to even just say the word. In your experience, why is it that people are finding that word offensive? So when I got the flag for hate speech, and it was like hate targeted to me, hate targeted to other groups. I stopped. I actually pulled the ads. I'm like, I got to understand this before I dive in. Mm-hmm. I spoke with some marketing folks. I'm like, what is it? You know, how do I get around this? One of the marketers said it this way. He says, it's the same reason why bald folks get mad at shampoo commercials. I was like, well, I guess that's true. I mean, I don't know. I don't understand it. And I think the hard part is I'm not making any judgment about anyone else's life. I'm just saying this is what child-free wealth looks like. I don't care about the other part because they're already dressed by somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. I talked to a reporter and um, he said it this way. He says it's one of the last un- underrepresented minority groups left mm-hmm. and nobody's talking about it. So here you are trailblazing, attempting to talk about it. And it's pretty, I mean, not that I think it needs any pushback, but it's sort of natural when the minority groups come out and they start speaking about things, that there will be some pushback because there have been certain ways that people have thought about that group. You can look across all platforms where people are talking about being child-free and there will always be people that come out of the woodwork and type on their keyboards and have some really passionate things to say about child-free people when in actuality, we're people like everyone else just living life. We've just made the choice not to be parents. Yeah. And I think finances makes everything more sensitive. Yes. I mean, most of the U.S. is struggling. Yeah, for sure. And then it's there is kind of this natural, if you're like, I'm going to talk about finance, like just people just get prickly Mm -hmm. and you go, I'm going to talk about finance and kids. And they're like, whoa, that's really scary. You know, and and some of that's natural, but I think some of it is we just need to be able to openly have the conversation. I agree. Because when you're struggling with something, you want to know that there's someone else out there struggling as well, because I feel like that really builds community and it builds community in every stage of life or every aspect of life, whether or not you're child free. Yeah. And that was one of the things. And one of the reasons why I decided to do a book just of the portraits is I realized there's not these, I don't know if you want to call them role models or examples, whatever you want to call them of what child free life looks like from a financial standpoint, you know, and, and does it actually work? And, you know, how do you plan that classic bingo of, you know, who's going to take care of when you're older and all that? Well, people have plans and structures and it works, but I think it's helpful to see people, Hey, they worked out well, this one's, you know, working through it and I'm somewhere in between or whatever that is. And it makes them feel just a little better. Absolutely. We want to feel relatable wherever we are in life. And I think reading through that, I could see myself like when I was going to university and some of the struggles that people were having in the massive student loan debts, I could completely relate with the individuals that were in that place in that book, because I remember what that time was like. And it's scary. And you want to know that, hey, you know, there's other people that have been there and they're getting through it. And so I think it's really encouraging to be able to read that. Yeah. And I think what I've found is that, you know, you send out a book to these, we call them beta readers, people like you that just give little feedback. And everybody picks somebody different. They're like, oh, that's the one I connect to. And it's really interesting to see. And it's not always somebody who's living the same life. Sometimes it's opposites or whatever else. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that makes sense. There's someone in here, JC, she, she shares her story about uh, she's debating dating somebody with kids. She <laughs> actually started dating this person before she chose to be child free. Yeah. And then can she, can she continue the relationship with somebody with kids? And it's a great you know, hers is a portrait of compromise. It's a great debate. Are you willing to make that compromise? Yes. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I've been married for 13 years, so I don't know the dating world, but I was looking at her story. I'm like, wow, that's a rough question right now. Yeah. I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm pretty strong child free. So I'd probably say, Hey, I'll put on the dating profile, you know, no kids, but mm-hmm. like, well, but what happens if you've already fallen for somebody and then Oh yeah, by the way, he has kids. I would have never thought of that, but it was amazing to read the story. What is something that you found as you were doing your research and putting this book together that you were not expecting? I think one of the things I was surprised by, and it's kind of weird as I'm reflecting on it, but the amount of people that said, I didn't know not having kids was a choice. There is people that like somewhere in their life, like, 
you know, I was going along and then I realized, oh, I don't have to have kids. There was no way to go except but having kids. And then all of a sudden something flipped. And a lot of that's cultural, religious, other components. And then I realized I reflected my life. I was probably a bit more of a fence sitter at first, but I think that was because I always thought the woman got to choose, you know, the guy had to follow along if we're going to have kids or not, you know, and, and, and you realize, huh, that is one of those things. And culturally, we just, there's, there's not even a choice to many people. It's just, it's expected. It's a life script. It's what you do. If you want to have kids, that's fine. If you don't, that's okay too, but make the decision not, I just fell into whichever camp. That is interesting because I've heard people say that too. And everyone has a different journey with that, right? Like when I was young, I just never wanted kids. I started telling people probably when I was 14 or 15, I remember very specifically telling an adult that I did not want kids. And that's the first time you get the pushback, like, oh, you're too young. You don't know what you want. You're going to change your mind. And then, you know, as life progresses, I really didn't speak about it again until, you know, later on in my adult years. But it is really interesting that People just go for the default. As a woman, you're just going to have kids. You're going to be a mom. That's just what you do. A lot of Gen Z folks in the book were were saying, hey, at 21, I got sterilized. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, Mm -hmm. you absolutely know your choice. And I support it completely. But we hear all the stories about people having trouble getting sterilized and doctors won't do it. Well, something is changing if people are willing to go forward at 21 and make that choice. We've made some progress somewhere if that's happening. I love it. I love hearing stories like that. You mentioned that you went online to find people to interview. Did you have difficulty finding people that wanted to be interviewed or that wanted their own name in print? My goal was to have about 10% of people that fill out the survey, which is completely anonymous, okay. volunteer to, to do the interview. And that was about right. And for those people that wanted to share their story, it was great. Some some of the people, you, you don't know who, some are the real names, some are their pseudonyms. They're allowed to do that and work through it. Um, It was a challenge to get a good cross section of people. I got lucky because there's a, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different backgrounds and ages and and process. I would have loved to get some people in that uh, 60s, 70s, 80s age, but I was mostly recruiting online. So that might've just been because of that. That makes sense. It's, I mean, I have a hard time using Zoom. So (laughs) I'd like to know a little bit more about your personal story of being child free. You had said you were a fence sitter. When did you come to the realization that, hey, I really don't want kids? And how did your wife or girlfriend at the time feel about that? Growing up, it's kind of like, it's just expected, you know, the, the, in reflection, I'm going, yep, that was the norm. You know, you, you have the two and a half kids and the dog and you, you live within 10 miles of where you grew up. You know, that was kind of like the way I was brought up. When I met my wife, uh, she has a medical issue that's a 50-50 chance of her dying if she got pregnant. That made the answer real simple. Oh, no kidding. That being said, you'd be still surprised. Family go, hey, you could still take the chance. You could monitor. I'm like, are you (laughs) kidding me? I'm not flipping a coin on somebody's life. We went to get married and my wife was raised Catholic. I was raised Methodist Mm -hmm. and she wanted to get married in Catholic church. I was like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So we go to talk to the priest and you got to do this whole thing. And he says, you have to agree to raise your kids Catholic. Sure. We're not having any, you know, it doesn't matter. Oh no. You have to agree to have kids and raise them. We couldn't get married in the Catholic church. Are you serious? Three different churches. Wouldn't do it. Wow. I did not know that was a thing. I didn't either. (laughs) (laughs) We got married in in a small little local church, Methodist church that I grew up in. And that was fine. Maybe some churches now will accept it. I mean, this was 13 years ago, but I was like, okay, so that's where the line is. And we have to pick a different choice. That's unbelievable. That I know that so almost leaves me speechless. You got married 13 years ago. It's not that long ago. Like it's not like it was 50 years ago. Right. Which is so strange that people still really think this way. We're both uh, PhDs. So we've moved around quite a bit for our jobs. It's just mm-hmm. part of the nature of the beast. And I've lived a bunch of different areas in the U S and I think it does matter where you live. You know, so we grew up mostly in the Northeast. It's a little bit more accepting of being child free. Mm-hmm. We moved in the Midwest. That was a different environment. In mm-hmm. the Midwest, I actually had a staff member work for me, stops me in the hall and says, I've been thinking about you and your wife. You're both really smart. You should have kids. And I'm like, what? In what world do you stop your boss in the middle of the hall and say, this is what he should do with his life? I'm like, but that's just accepted. It was part of the culture and it was normal. And 
you know, we're now uh, actually in the Mississippi, so we're in the South, and it's yet an, again another spin. Fortunately, we're now old enough that uh, the questions are getting less. I do find the questions change as you get older, because now you get a lot of, well, who's going to take care of you? And aren't you worried? Because what if you have health problems? And it takes you down a whole other rabbit hole. All right. So I got to go on my rant. I apologize. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) So this question about who's going to take care of you when you're older, this one drives me batty from a financial standpoint. So here's what the census says. They did a whole bunch of studies on this. They found that two and a half percent of childless, because they use the term childless, they're talking about biological in this case, but two and a half percent of childless individuals over 55 get any support from their family financially. So that's a pretty low number. Mm. Backs up the question. But that same data source said one and a half percent of parents get any support from their family. So parents actually get less support than the childless over 55. Interesting. As child-free folks, we know we have to take care of it. Yes. Others are making an assumption. So when somebody says, well, who's going to take care of you when you're older? What drives me crazy is they're assuming somebody takes care of them. Yeah, exactly. And and they're like, I'm just not going to deal with it. I'm like, the data says you're worse off than I am. I mean, we're both pretty bad, but (laughs) you know, (laughs) the bottom line is we just take responsibility and know we have to do it. And how many individuals do we both know that are of the retirement age and they have children, their children live nowhere near them. They hardly ever see them. Like that is the story that you hear over and over and over again. So it's not about who's going to take care of you when you're old, like take care of it yourself. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, we got to do some different paperwork because like the healthcare system falls apart if you don't have kids, you know, but so we have to think about some of those things, but we know we have a plan and we're not relying on people or burdening people or anything like that. We're just, we have a plan. That's right. You know, it, it's, it was part of my wife and I's retirement plan from the beginning to, you know, we want to stay home as long as we can and have in home help if we need to all that. And it's just a regular discussion while others are like, well, they'll come by and visit and they haven't visited in the last year. And you're like, you need a plan. And I think because it is kind of a topic that people shy away from because it's financial and then it's like end of life stuff, which no one likes to talk about, but not talking about it doesn't mean it's going to be taken care of just on its own. Like something just is going to fall out of the sky and you're going to be taken care of. We need to talk about these hard topics and we need to have a plan. And then it's not as scary. And if something pops up, you're like, Hey, well, I've got a little nest egg here, or I've made some connections with people. Absolutely. And people go, well, I'll do a plan once I'm rich. No, you need to start a lot younger than that. And I think part of that is as child-free folks, we have a lot more considerations. The book bottom line is you have more time, money, and freedom Mm -hmm. to do what you want. Yes. But that actually could be paralysis for us Mm -hmm. because when you have, when you can do anything, that's like harder than being pushed into a corner, Mm -hmm. you know, because you could do anything. You're like, well, if I'm not happy, I should change something. And people are like, what? I should change. So we need to start planning earlier. I think the other part of it is we need to realize that there, you know, the, to, to follow along with the elder question, those same people ask the question are expecting you to take care of them. Mm-hmm. So we need a plan for taking care of our elderly parents and others. Yes. I call it the financial bingo. It's well, Hannah doesn't have kids, so she can. And yes. it continues to, she can give me a hundred bucks. She can buy toys for my kids or she can take care of mom. And, and that becomes just an expectation mm-hmm. on us which isn't fair, but we need to have a plan for. We need to set good boundaries. We need to start on that early rather than mom being dropped off in the basement going, hey, she now lives with you. (laughs) And all of a sudden that's an expectation. Yeah, we need to have the hard conversations and we need to have them early enough so that when the time comes, we have some sort of structured plan and things don't always go to plan, but having a plan that doesn't quite work out hundred percent is better than having no plan at all. And then everyone's in a panic and expecting things from other people that maybe they can't deliver. Absolutely. What is the takeaway that you would like people to have after they've read your book? I think the the biggest takeaway is you're not alone. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, there's somebody in this book that you're going to recognize in your life. Um, So you're going to be able to find somebody there. The other thing you're going to find is that those who did well financially did two things. They got out of debt and stayed out and they maxed out their retirement plan. That's it. And I love those two things because they sound really simple, but they take time and they take patience. And that's why it's better to start those things early in life than waiting until you're kind of in the place where you're like, oh, shoot, I haven't started any of this. I need to do it now. I've only got 10 years left or 20 years left. I'm laughing because I get calls from people at one of two times. So I pay for my bills by 
doing financial planning. I get calls either when like something good has happened, like they got a big job, got a big raise, they got a, or, uh oh, <laughs> happened. You know, something bad has happened or life changes happened and they now need, they're scrambling. <laughs> the truth is, for most people, that's when they're willing to learn is when something good or bad happens. It'd be great if we all had a plan before that. But you don't want to have to make that frantic call going, hey, my car just caught on fire and I have no car and I need to get to work tomorrow. What do I do? Or, you know, hey, my mom just decided she's coming to live with me. What do we do? Well, hold on. All of those we should have planned for. That's hard to get people to get there because I think it's really hard to ask for help with finances. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing I found in talking to people is if you're going to work with like a financial planner or a financial coach or something, make sure to ask them, how is your plan different because you're child free? Mm -hmm. And many people, many of the planners go, well, I mean, not much difference. Well, then run. Okay. Mm -hmm. If they don't see the difference, they don't understand you. It's different to live a life that's child free. Yeah, absolutely. What is your best financial tip for child free people? Get out of debt and stay out. It's, the, it's probably the hardest one, yeah. but it's if you can have a good foundation and have no debt, you can fake the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's an important one, especially in our economy. It's, it's scary, I think, everywhere right now. For those who have done it, there's that moment when you're like, all right, first month I don't have any debt. What do I do with this money? Because <laughs> you're so used to paying the credit card and the car and the house. And, the, and now you're like, huh, I actually have money. Yeah. Do I want to take a trip? Do I want to put this in my And it's, but it's, nobody's used to it. All of a sudden you're like, stop. You're like, wow, my world's different. Yeah. And that's where we're all hoping to get to sooner rather than later. <laughs> Absolutely. So please tell us, where can people find your book? Yeah, so it's Portraits of Child Free Wealth. It's available Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere books are sold. Um, it actually comes out in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. And I'm going to have a link down in the description box of this YouTube video for anybody that wants to check it out. Thank you again so much for your time, Dr. J. I really appreciate it. Thank you.